Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this year's World Usability Day Tech Talk. My name is Adam Larry, and I'm with the Human Factors Research Department here at Cerner. And so far today, we've heard from Paul Weaver about developing trust in artificial intelligence, Ann Miller about integrating AI into clinical work, and Corwin Strout about the impact of culture, processes, and human connection in design. But what about how AI is incorporated into other high-risk environments, like the US military? And what lessons can we learn from them? Today's tech talk is entitled Accelerating AI Adoption in the Military, and I'm thrilled to introduce our guest speaker this year and one of my oldest friends, Greg Allen. Greg joins us today from Washington, D.C., where he's the Chief of Strategy and Communications at the Department of Defense's Joint Artificial Intelligence Center. There, he advises on the development and implementation of the Department of Defense's AI strategy. In 2018, the DOD established a joint AI center to bring the benefits of modern AI-enabled technology to the U.S. military. Greg will share his experiences standing up the Joint AI Center and applying AI-enabled technologies to disaster relief, military logistics, and medical imagery analysis, with special consideration to how user experience and usability testing are incorporated into the development and fielding process. Of the publications I've reviewed about AI, Greg's analyses have always delivered clear and concise accounts of otherwise complex AI concepts. His work has appeared in media outlets such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Economist, Nature, CNN, Fox News, Foreign Policy, and Wired Magazine. As we go throughout today's uh, presentation, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat, and we will address any outstanding questions at the end of the presentation. So how has the Department of Defense tackled the complexities of AI integration? I'll turn it over to Greg so he can tell you himself. Hi, folks. Uh, I'm Greg Allen, and it's a pleasure to be joining you here today. Uh, as Adam said, um, uh, he is one of my oldest friends. And so it's a delight to be able to join you all here today uh, and to participate in this uh, session. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, but you can uh, see the slides. Is that right? Yes, you were all set, Greg. OK, and it wasn't showing the uh, presenter mode. You were seeing the actual real thing? Uh, it was for a, It's showing the presenter mode now, but it was showing the real thing. OK, so. great. That's what I wanted to verify. Um, and uh, just interrupt me via audio, because while I do this, I won't be able to actually see any questions that are uh, submitted via text. So uh, to begin, um, my name is Greg Allen. Uh, this is my first job in the Department of Defense. Uh, prior to doing this, I was in the think tank community, uh, which has a lot of policy analysis, technology analysis and writing. Uh, and before that, I was in corporate strategy for sort of a variety of companies, uh, most recently Blue Origin, uh, which makes uh, space orbital launch vehicles, uh, like it's a manufacturer of the rockets that go to space. Um, but in the AI space in particular, I did a lot of analysis in this area, uh, originally for the US intelligence community, uh, and then just sort of an open publications. Um, so I've been looking at this both from the industrial dynamics of AI technology, as well as the sort of specific applications that make it difficult uh, in certain types of institutions, such as the Department of Defense. And so when the DOD announced that it was setting up a joint AI center specifically to accelerate the adoption of AI, um, I, of course, jumped at the opportunity to uh, serve the country um, and help tackle this problem. So I will talk about um, sort of a few different flavors of the problem today. Um, and I'll be happy to be interrupted you know, to take the conversation in a direction that is of interest to the audience. Um, but I'll start with what uh, didn't used to be a joke, uh, but suddenly is. So this is the former Secretary of Defense, Mark Esper. He was fired uh, only a couple of days ago. But this quote comes from the congressional testimony in which uh, he was uh, confirmed by the Senate as the Secretary of Defense. Uh, and I want to uh, read it here because I think it's quite interesting. Um, Advances in AI have the potential to change the character of warfare for generations to come. Whichever, whichever nation harnesses AI first will have a decisive advantage on the battlefield for many, many years. Uh, we have to get there first. And while uh, Dr. Esper is no longer the Secretary of Defense, I would say that that view as, uh, as espoused there um, is really a bipartisan view shared in Congress, uh, as well as uh, across the Department of Defense and US national security leadership. Um, and the sort of rationale for that uh, is that we view AI as sort of a critical enabling technology for a bunch of applications that are going to be quite useful uh, for national security. So if you can uh, sort of put on your historical cap and think back, you know, 80 some years ago uh, when we were inventing the first electromechanical computers, 
Uh, originally, they had a few niche, really powerful applications, such as uh, breaking enemy codes uh, or serving as the missile, uh, as the guidance systems to uh, long range missiles. Um, but eventually, um, computers are a part of just about every single thing that the Department of Defense does, uh, whether that's back office business processes or frontline battlefield type work. Um, and we believe that, that that similar arc is likely to take place on uh, the story for artificial intelligence technology, and in particular, machine learning technology. Um, and I'll get more into that in a bit. So recognizing this opportunity for the future of competitive military advantage and U.S. national security, um, we, the department decided to stand up my organization, uh, the Joint AI Center, um, which was specifically focused on accelerating the adoption of AI. And the, the nature of that um, mission statement of accelerating DOD's adoption and integration of AI is really targeted at a specific problem set. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with DARPA, um, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Um, their mandate is to really advance the state of the art in artificial intelligence uh, and a host of other sort of technical domains. They are extremely good at that job. Um, DARPA is most famously responsible for uh, the research breakthroughs that led to the internet and the creation of the internet uh, several decades ago. Um, but the number of technologies where their, their programs have delivered remarkable, true cutting edge breakthroughs it's a really long list. So the problem is not so much on the basic research and development side. The problem is that a lot of that great research never actually makes its way uh, into the hands of war fighters in the military or folks who work in the Department of Defense. Um, the frame that we had for artificial intelligence was that we do not have a innovation problem. We have a innovation adoption problem. And so my organization was specifically tasked with uh, addressing those kinds of challenges. And we have grown incredibly rapidly. Uh, we were created in the middle of 2018 um, when the department released its artificial intelligence strategy. And we have grown from around 20 people when I joined in February of 2019 to just about 150 people now. Uh, so that is a rather extraordinary pace of growth. Um, a lot of our challenges are sort of familiar challenges to any kind of startup, um, but we also have the challenges that you have when you live in a massive bureaucracy uh, like the Department of Defense. So you can see that our vision statement is to transform the Department of Defense through AI. What I mean when I say that transformation is kind of the, the world that we live in now with computers, where computers are a key enabling feature of every single thing uh, that we do across the Department of Defense. Our goal is to make that a reality um, for advanced artificial intelligence capabilities as well. Now, the Jake is, as I said, has grown really rapidly. Uh, we have a budget of about $250 million a year and about 150 personnel overall. But our job is an extraordinary one. We are trying to transform an organization with a budget of $700 billion per year, uh, and depending on how you count, more than 2.1 million employees. It's actually closer to uh, 3.5 million if you include all the reservists, National Guard members, the civilians who work for the Department of Defense, and the contractors who um, work for private sector companies, but they spend uh, all of their day, every day, uh, doing Department of Defense type of work. So just imagine you know, trying to change uh, one stubborn person's mind and how difficult that can be. And then think about trying to change, you know, 3 million people's mind uh, to doing it. Now, of course, we had the support of, we had and have the support of the senior most DOD leadership. But anytime you want to turn a ship that big, uh, it's a really challenge. It's a really tough task. And that's why we framed um, our approach to all of this as one of leverage. Uh, we're looking for the activities that we can do um, that are going to exert the most uh, impact across the entire Department of Defense. If you're familiar with the ancient Greek mathematician Archimedes, he pointed out um, and made a statement that, you know, give me a lever uh, long enough and a place to put it and I can move the entire Earth. Um, and that happens to be true as a matter of physics, um, but it's also true in sort of organizational transformation. And so we look at that from uh, three sort of avenues of leverage, you could call it. 
Um, the first sort of big thing, big group of activities that we do are what we call mission initiatives. And this is where we're actually developing um, AI enabled technologies and getting it in the hands of end users um, across the Department of Defense. I'm gonna talk about more of these sort of AI enabled capabilities a little bit later in the talk. Um, but there, it's not just enough to actually build those capabilities if you wanna transform the entire Department of Defense. Remember our goal is not to spend $250 million to buy $250 million worth of AI capabilities. Our goal is to spend $250 million to transform $700 billion. And that's why just as important as developing the technology is documenting the processes and best practices under which we develop that technology and teaching other parts of the Department of Defense to replicate our achievements. Um, this is sort of get back to a uh, give a person a fish versus teach them to fish uh, kind of approach. We view teaching um, in terms of AI capability development as some of the most important activities we do. The second big group of activities we have is what we call the Joint Common Foundation. Um, and this is really the enabling infrastructure for developing AI software. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you folks have developed software uh, and you can attest to the difference it is between when you're writing software only for yourself versus when your software has to merge with all of the different um, software components that have been built over many decades and are currently being built um, by your colleagues. Uh, and in, in many ways, it's as though you're sort of writing a Hollywood script and one person is in charge of writing act one and another person is in charge of writing act five. Well, if the person in act one kills a character who you have as the hero of act five, um, then your script isn't gonna be any good. And it's a very similar story when it comes to software engineering and developing code. When in the, as you do in the case of the Department of Defense, you have hundreds or thousands of people uh, developing software, you need to make sure it all works together and solving that problem really gets to um, the, the, the correct platform upon which you're developing that software and the correct practices that you're using, um, which we in the DOD, uh, or at least the, the cohort of the DOD that I'm a big fan of, are really big fans of the DevOps uh, approach to solving this problem. And so we're developing the Joint Common Foundation to be that uh, development platform and suite of infrastructure capabilities that you need uh, to develop and manage uh, and implement and operate high quality software, but we're also specifically trying to tackle um, the parts of that problem that get hard when you're going after machine learning software. Um, a lot of developing machine learning software and AI, modern AI software has some of the same challenges as traditional software, but it also has a, a pretty big element of unique difficulties. And we're trying to develop the technical infrastructure and provide that DOD wide that will lower those technical barriers so that we can increase the productivity of every machine learning software developer across the DOD and the industry partners who support the DOD. And then the last sort of big group uh, of activities that we do in the Joint AI Center falls under our uh, strategy and policy uh, division. This is where I work. Um, and so our responsibility is to lead the implementation of the DOD AI strategy uh, and chair the DOD AI governance process. And that's where we wanna identify, hey, there's this regulation that somebody wrote in 1995 that kind of sort of made sense that then, uh, but it's really hamstringing our AI efforts now. We wanna identify those policy and process barriers and knock them down so that everybody uh, in the DOD can be more productive in developing AI capabilities and getting them into productive operations. So with those three big categories of activities combined, um, our mission is very much to transform the Department of Defense uh, into an AI-enabled fighting force. Um, I do wanna point out just one thing here, and I think in the invite to this, you should have received a paper that I wrote um, called Understanding AI Technology. Um, and that paper is really designed to highlight the sort of differences between machine learning-based AI technology and more traditional uh, software-based AI technology using a more handcrafted knowledge approach. Um, the reason I bring this up now is I just wanna point out that when you're referring specifically to the handcrafted knowledge approach of AI, in which the knowledge of the system is really just a long list of software rules, um, the Department of Defense has been very good at that uh, for a very long time. 
Uh, my favorite example of this is what's called the uh, GCAS of the F-16 fighter aircraft. Uh, GCAS stands for Ground Collision Avoidance System. So essentially, if a pilot uh, is executing a turn uh, at too sharp of a, a turn angle, well, then they might black out because all the blood uh, falls out of their brain as they're executing uh, that turn maneuver. Well, if they black out, they obviously can't fly the plane and they may crash. Um, but what's so remarkable about, remarkable about the F-16, which is equipped with this GCAS system, is that it can actually detect when the pilot blacks out, um, automatically take over control of the aircraft, fly the plane at a level, um, at a level path until the pilot regains consciousness and can resume control of the aircraft. Um, that's an example of a handcrafted knowledge AI system. It does not use machine learning. Uh, we originally did this in the 1980s, um, and it's an incredible system. I mean, when I when I think about that system, I mean, it really makes me want to say, you know, go America. Uh, we built that. It's a really cool uh, piece of software, and it's a really cool capability uh, to give our Air Force and Navy pilots. Um, but again, that that does not use any machine learning. Um, so the most advanced capabilities of AI that have really become exciting in the past decade um, are primarily using machine learning capabilities. And that introduces a sort of new suite of challenges uh, for how you create the software and how you manage it over the life cycle of the software development process. So as Adam mentioned, I'm going to be going through sort of a few of the, uh, the capabilities that the, the Joint AI Center has been responsible in partnership with other parts of the DOD for developing and fielding. Uh, but just keep in the back of your mind that this is only um, one chunk of our overall portfolio and mandate to transform the Department of Defense. Uh, and that in each one of these, you know, some of the most important work that we do is not just developing the AI system, um, but in sharing the knowledge that we learn by going through this process with other folks across the department so that they can um, sort of replicate our achievement uh, and also learn from our failures. Uh, you know, we're a very young organization. We don't get everything exactly right the first time out of the gate. Um, but our sort of main priority is to make sure that we're always learning and we're helping the, as many other folks in the department learn uh, as best we can. So this uh, is what we call a mission initiative. Um, it's essentially a, a project team um, that includes a sort of a suite of AI enabled capability developments. Um, and this first one relates to humanitarian assistance and disaster relief in wildfire scenarios. Uh, this piece of technology was actually written up um, just last month or maybe two months ago uh, in Wired Magazine. Um, and it was my organization uh, that was responsible for doing this. We've been working on this uh, for over a year. So if you can direct your attention to the GIF in the top right of the screen, um, what you're looking at is actually an MQ-9 uh, Reaper drone. Um, if you've heard of a Predator drone, uh, it looks quite similar, um, but it's kind of the more newer, more upgraded version of the Predator drone. Uh, and this is flying over a wildfire in California. Um, and the red part um, is detected fire based on the infrared camera um, on board the uh, MQ-9. And so you might ask yourself, you know, why are we flying uh, these expensive aircraft uh, over wildfires? You know, they're large and burning. Um, isn't it pretty easy to tell why, where a wildfire is? Um, and in one sense, that's true. If it's right in front of your face, it's pretty easy to tell that there's a fire there. Um, but, but think about it from the big counter wildfire operation standpoint. Um, some of these wildfires move really quite fast. Uh, they can change locations based on wind uh, and the amount of burning material that they are consuming uh, quite rapidly. And so knowing not just where the fire is, but where it's likely to go so that you can optimize the deployment of your personnel and your resources, um, that's a much bigger challenge than you might think. And the sort of existing uh, best practice for how to tell where a wildfire is uh, is based on this network of spotters who are calling in what they see uh, on a radio. And then so somebody might be trying to, you know, have a, a, a gr an acetate paper map on the back, back of a truck using a grease pen trying to be like, okay, if the wildfire is here, then maybe I should send this part of my team um, over there. It's a really kind of old school approach uh, to deploying personnel and resources. And so what this uh, piece of technology does using um, machine learning, in this case, 
um, supervised learning and uh, convolutional neural networks, it can analyze the infrared image as it's coming off of the drone and then automatically the, 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 the term of art is geo-register, but all of that means is uh, determine the GPS coordinates of what the sensor is looking at on the surface of the earth and then automatically plot that on a map. So imagine um, if you were uh, on top of a mountain that you had hiked to the top of and then you took out your smartphone and you took a picture of a very far away mountain range. Imagine if your phone not just gave you the GPS coordinates of where you are, where the phone GPS receiver is, but the GPS coordinates of that mountain very far in the distance of the image. Um, that's a much more difficult technical task, and that's what this uh, system can automatically do. So um, it, can, it can observe hundreds of miles uh, very quickly, and then automatically put into a mapping application that is pushed to a uh, National Guardsman or a uh, California Fire uh, Agency's uh, first responders mobile phone. And so they can have a comprehensive situational awareness as to where the fire is, where it's likely to go, uh, in a much more user-friendly uh, software application. And the ultimate benefit to all of this, of course, is that we can more wisely allocate our resources. Um, you wanna make sure that of the finite number of people you have, of the finite number of water trucks you have, of the finite number of helicopters you have, you wanna make sure that you are making the best decisions um, to allocate those people uh, to the wisest degree. Um, and because I know this is a user experience and usability uh, focused conference, I wanna point out that you know, from the very first day that we said that we wanted to develop this system, one of the key things that we did was get partners in the end user community, in this case, the California Air National Guard. And we said, you know, we wanna embark upon this journey with you. Uh, we don't wanna just sort of coop ourselves up in a basement and create this piece of software. Um, what we really like to do is to, you know, talk to you about the challenges that you face in your um, in your operations, and then come back with, you know, what is the capability that we think can be most useful to you. So originally, our hypothesis was, oh, maybe AI computer vision could be really good for um, spotting people who are on roofs and you know might be waving their hands, begging for help. Um, but when we talked to the users in the National Guard and learned about their problem, we're like, oh, the, the real challenge they have, the real pain point they have uh, is in really just understanding where the fire is and where it's going. And so we completely uh, you know, re-vectored um, the, the nature of the product. And then at every step, you know, we were, okay, let's develop a prototype. Let's go take it to the end user community. Let's have them play around with it. Tell us what they like, tell us what they don't like. Um, and that's really quite unusual uh, for how things work in the Department of Defense. Um, but it's absolutely critical for a project where um, data gathering and data labeling is sort of a critical input to the success of the system. And then similarly, where we wanted to make sure it had the functionality the users needed uh, and actually to, in order to accelerate their mission. So um, I'm only talking about the wildfire one here, but I, I do want to point out that that's not the only thing going on. Uh, we also have another uh, system that can analyze uh, satellite imagery in order to identify uh, road obstruction uh, in a sort of earthquake or hurricane-based disaster. Basically, um, if a tree falls down in the road, uh, this system can automatically analyze the satellite imagery and tell first responders, hey, you can't go that way, it's blocked, and also tell them, hey, it's blocked in a way that's going to require two people with a shovel, or it's, it's blocked in a way that's going to require a bulldozer, um, that kind of functionality to do it. Normally, this is all done by humans sort of looking at satellite uh, imagery and uh, hand putting in everything. And in the case of a, you know, a Puerto Rico earthquake in January of this year, um, that took uh, weeks. Um, and what people really need is the opportunity to be helpful and respond to the needs of those affected by a disaster in hours or days. And it's really only feasible to get there through automation. So for a 99% accurate solution, uh, in the case of the satellite imagery tool, um, you're probably going to want some real human analysts uh, looking at it, but that 99% solution might take two weeks. Um, the 85% accurate solution can be ready in a matter of hours. And then when you're talking about saving lives after a disaster, uh, that can be a big deal. So the, the next application of AI that we're working on uh, relates to joint logistics. 
Uh, and I'll talk just uh, about one of the projects here uh, around optimization of maintenance. Um, the Department of Defense spends tens of billions of dollars every year just taking the stuff we've already bought and making sure it still works. Um, and this actually has a big implications uh, for how strong the military is. Um, you know, it's, it's very fashionable uh, in American discourse about the military to count ships, uh, to say this is a 300 ship Navy. What we need is a 500 ship Navy. Or, you know, we only have 500 of this type of aircraft. What we really need is 700 type of this aircraft. But when you hear those numbers, you should always be thinking about in the back of your mind, what are the maintenance downtime of all of these systems? Because if you have a ship that on average spends six months out at sea and then six months in port being repaired, well, then really each ship is kind of only 50% of a ship. Because in terms of, you know, days per year that you're actually able to use that ship, um, you don't really have all the days in the year. You only have the days when it's not down for maintenance. Um, and that is true for basically every type of vehicle in the Department of Defense fleet. And so if you can um, shorten the amount of time that systems spend in maintenance, um, it's the functional equivalent of buying more of those systems uh, and making the military more effective. So not only are you saving tens of billions of dollars, you're actually increasing the combat effectiveness uh, and deterrence potential of the force. So in, in our case, we're very interested in using uh, machine learning based uh, data analysis in order to analyze the, the, the maintenance records of vehicles and predict when they might break. Um, and here's just one example. The uh, MH-60 helicopter, uh, which you might have heard of as a Black Hawk, the Black Hawk, like from Black Hawk Down, um, is the Army variant of this helicopter. Uh, the other services use sort of slightly modified versions of this helicopter. Um, so it's very widely used across the entire military, Air Force, Navy, Army, Marine Corps. Um, and uh, this helicopter is sort of a uh, really effective uh, piece of machinery. It's been used for a long time because it's a pretty good helicopter. Um, but specifically, when you're fighting in you know, Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, folks notice that it has one you know, kind of big challenge, which is that it sucks sand in uh, through the air intake that goes into the engine. Um, and then the engine is so hot that it can actually melt that sand into glass. And while the engine is still hot, that's not a big deal. Um, but once the engine cools down, uh, then that, that sand uh, turns to solid glass. And the solid glass is uh, so strong that it prevents the engine from starting. Or if it does successfully start, you can actually do a lot of damage to this engine. Uh, and each of these engines costs millions of dollars. And so this glass over problem, um, you know, you would hope could be solved with a filter, uh, it turns out it can't be solved with a filter. It's just kind of a really tricky problem, especially when you're doing complicated flight maneuvers uh, in a desert environment, uh, such as those where uh, the military has been operating for a long time. And the other challenge is it's really tough to know when you're experiencing one of these glass over problems. You really don't feel um, the challenge until it's too late. Uh, the engine is cold and now it won't start. And that's the first time you really get a sense that you have this glass over problem. Um, and so the Jake started thinking, well, you know, it's difficult for pilots to detect when you're likely to experience a glass over a uh, hot start type of problem. Um, but there's also a lot of sensors all over the engine. And there's, uh, there's sensors all over the aircraft. And what if secretly, you know, somewhere lurking in the data uh, that's coming off of all of these uh, helicopters and all the data from all the helicopters that have been flying uh, you know, over the past 10 years, what if we could put um, an AI-based analysis of that data, correlate it with those engines that had uh, these glass over problems, and what if secretly you know, there is the opportunity to detect these glass over problems uh, before they occur? Because what you really don't want to happen is you, know, you fly a long way out in your helicopter in harm's way, uh, you land, and then you wait for a few hours and then you need to leave and suddenly you can't leave anymore and you're stuck in harm's way because your engine has glassed over. Um, so being able to predict these glass over problems in advance was sort of a key pain point um, for our user community, which was in uh, special forces. 
And uh, lo and behold, uh, it was in fact true. We were able to um, you know, put together a data analysis software product uh, that could detect when these problems were likely to happen. And that's actually in use uh, in the field right now. They make decisions about you know, that aircraft is approved to fly, that aircraft is not approved to fly uh, based on this piece of software that we created. Um, and that's a, that's a real point of pride for us. Um, and again, as I said before, you know, our close cooperation with this user community, in this case, Special Forces, um, was really key in making sure that this, this product could fit into their workflows, could be a part of their daily life and daily work experience. Um, that was a, was a really important part of the story. Uh, and then I know that Cerner has a, you know, a massive focus on the healthcare space and on the medicine space. And so um, I wanted to include today for sure uh, that we also have a mission initiative focused around warfighter health. Um, and there's a, there's a bunch of different parts of this portfolio um, that are quite different from one another. Uh, you know, one deals with um, tracking the sorts of things that are correlated with leading to um, really tragic soldier or veteran suicides. Uh, and another one deals with sort of analyzing uh, images that come off of an X-ray or of a CAT scan or a CT scan. Um, so there's sort of a, a diversity uh, of these types of things. Um, I'll just talk about one part uh, for today, um, which is part of the medical imagery portfolio. Um, hopefully most of the folks here are familiar with pathology, uh, but essentially there's you know, uh, these slides that are samples of something that is believed to be you know, um, some kind of problem. Um, that might be uh, representative because of a, you know, of a biopsy of some piece of tissue from a patient uh, that turns out you know, is cancer, or it might be you know, indicative of some kind of disease, um, so on and so forth. Well, it happens to be the case that the Department of Defense has really one of the largest repositories of um, pathology slides uh, in the entire world, um, like tens of millions of pathology slides. Um, and not only do we have this massive um, sort of historical uh, set of physical uh, slides um, from various sort of pathologies, but we know because those folks are in the military medical system or in the vet veteran medical medical system, we actually know the long term health outcomes uh, that happen to those people. So we might have you know a slide that's from ten years ago, uh, and it says, okay, this slide you know said um, that it was this type of problem, um, and then we know that actually uh, ten years later that problem you know manifested itself in this other kind of big complication or that they got better and it wasn't a big deal. And so I hope what you're, what you're, you know, the wheels in your head are turning that this is a really amazing data set, kind of unlike um, anything else in the world when it comes to um, pathology uh, imagery and imagery analysis, uh, because it's connected to both the, uh, the, the real world data of the slide, um, as well as the sort of long-term outcomes. And if you, could, if you could stitch those two things together, you'd have a really you know, powerful data set um, to do health research on um, and to sort of make an impact. And so we're, we're paying for digitizing, sort of digitally scanning uh, with really high, um, really high resolution imagery, sort of an initial subset of the millions of slides that are in the Joint Pathology Center. And then we're running experiments with um, machine learning based imagery analysis to you know, sort of test the hypothesis is this actually a really promising thing? You know, we, we have reasons why we think it's a really promising thing for the Department of Defense to do, uh, but because it's gonna be so expensive, we wanted to run this prototype uh, before we sort of scale it up into the whole big shebang. So there are more projects and more types of projects. I just, I just gave you an overview of three of our mission initiatives. You know, we have other mission initiatives that are a bit closer to the tip of the spear uh, when it comes to war fighting, we also have stuff that's you know more back office productivity, uh, financial analysis kind of a thing. Um, you know, our portfolio is pretty broad because the Department of Defense is pretty broad. It's four percent of the entire American economy for crying out loud. So the opportunity for AI capabilities is really broad. I just gave you sort of a, a subset, which I hope uh, will be interesting to you folks. Uh, and at this point, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to take your questions.
Hey, Greg, thank you. That was awesome. So um, for everyone out there, as an Army veteran myself, I can attest to how little consideration has traditionally been given to the end users of technologies fielded in the Department of Defense. So it's really refreshing to hear the Jake's approach to incorporating end users into that technology design. Uh, we do have quite a bit of time for questions. Um, and so as we wait for some of those to roll into the chat, uh, I'll start with a few of my own. Um, so bring up that Warfighter Health slide again. I, I'm hoping you could elaborate a little bit on how the JAG approached end users when developing that application of AI. So in that, in that application, um, it was sort of at the stage where it was not uh, end user intensive um, because it was more about like, we would build a data set that we could then use in the future to develop capabilities that might be useful to end user communities. Okay. Um, so I'm cheating, but in that one, uh, you know, we didn't really talk to the end user community, but we certainly would as the project reached the stage where we think that's appropriate. In that case, I'll step it back a little bit and just ask, what is the Jake's overall approach uh, to uh, to incorporating end users. I know there's a lot of different yeah. out there. And maybe, maybe I'll start um, yeah. before I talk about how good we are, I'll talk about how bad the average is uh, in the Department of Defense. Um, you know, your your purchasing experience as you know an everyday American is just so, so different uh, from how the Department of Defense buys stuff. Um, so you think, you know, oh, I want a car. I'll go look out at all the sort of people who make cars. I'll compare the prices with the features with my needs, and then I'll buy the car and I might have it um, a day, you know, that, that day that I decided to buy my car. Um, in the Department of Defense, uh, the, the process by which anything gets bought, um, especially anything complicated, expensive, and important um, is really uh, long-term. And there's some good reasons for that, and there's some bad reasons for that. Um, the good reasons for that is that a lot of the stuff we buy, we're the only people who buy that, right? Um, when it comes to like laptop computers, well, the DOD buys those and the rest of America buys those, right? But when it comes to um, stealth fighter aircraft, well, there's not really much of a commercial market uh, for that. So we're really the only game in town um, who buys that kind of stuff. And the companies that make that uh, know that only the DOD buys that. And so the, the relationship is such that the Department of Defense says, you know, you must buy, you must build me an aircraft that has all of these features. Um, and then, you know, we have to engage in this very complicated process of, um, you know, preventing corruption because you don't want to say, oh, we gave this company an unfair advantage in winning the contract to define, uh, to, to build this aircraft. Um, and so that dance of requirement, what's called requirements generation, where we say we must have an aircraft that does these things. And then the stage of, you know, we are now going to uh, competitively solicit a contract and award a contract to a company who, you know, meets all of these requirements at the lowest price. And then, and, and, and potentially, if, if there are other you know major criteria at the lowest risk or the fastest time frame, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then, once we've awarded the contract, now you're actually going to go out and do it. That time frame is so long um, uh, uh, for for a, what's called a major defense acquisitions program, an MDAP. Um, the average time frame between requirements generation, we need something that does this to um, it's actually out there in the field is seven years. That's the average, right? Like somebody, you know, somebody could be out there basically being like, oh, you know, we're really getting our butts kicked because we don't have a system that does X. And they like, you know, go through the bureaucratic morass of generating a requirement to solve X, right? And then seven years later, you know, that person's, you know, children will be, be able to benefit um, from using this system uh, that is based on problems that are old problems. The, 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 the real problem might be different from that. Um, and so that, that process that I just described, and, and of course I'm oversimplifying uh, in order to be brief, um, is traditionally fault, you know, what we call a waterfall uh, type acquisition. And maybe some of you have ever sort of heard that, ter uh, that term of art. Um, and what we really want to move to increasingly in DoD, especially for software, uh, but in some cases also in hardware, we want to move to something that is more close to the, the agile uh, process for software development. So I, I hope a lot of the, the software developers in the audience are being like, there are parts of the DoD that don't use agile. 
Um, yes, there are massive parts of the DoD that don't use Agile. And this is like the crisis uh, that we are trying to solve. Um, and so what we're really trying to get to is instead of having these massive updates that happen once every seven years, and when they happen, they break everything that they touch because they're sort of incompatible uh, in that Hollywood script way that I described, we want to get to sort of smaller releases more frequently. And so that, that people just sort of get used to their systems getting better on some regular cadence uh, rather than, you know, pulling out their GPS tracker uh, that looks like it's from a 1990s James Bond movie instead of, you know, the thing that they could just go buy uh, on Amazon that would be much better. Um, so there are parts there are parts of the Department of Defense that feel like you're living in the future. There are some really cool technologies that only we have. Uh, but there are also really large parts of the Department of Defense where you feel like you're stuck in the 1980s or 1990s and you're wondering, why are we still using this old crappy uh, technology? And that's especially true in software. And so um, moving towards that, you know, the, the requirements are based on conversations with users in real time, not like the requirements that were written down seven years ago. Uh, but no kidding, you know, the requirements, because we, as we're in the development process, we are still in contact with end user communities. Um, that's like a massive priority for us uh, in every single system that we develop. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, you definitely hit it on the head and you generate about 20 more questions from me, but I want to turn it over to some of the audience real quick. So we have a question from Anne here, which is in contrast to the glass over situation where you can directly correlate a sensor to a mechanical process, in the pathology situation, you don't have a precise sensor correlating to that process that you can um, intervene on, on in medicine. So how do you close that? Uh, well, gap? so um, let me think about what I, I would frame it in sort of what we're trying to accomplish uh, in each of the situations. So we have data outputs, which is uh, flight records and the maintenance records of the aircraft. And then we kind of have data inputs, which is the sensor data feeds for the aircraft. And what we wanna do is we wanna use the data inputs to predict the future data outputs. So we have historical examples of data outputs, but we wanna predict in real time future uh, data outputs based on uh, live uh, data. Um, and that is broadly uh, similar to what we're trying to do in the pathology case. So we will have um, real world, we have historical data, which is these old slides, and then we have, that's historical input data. And then we have historical output data, which is the medical outcomes that were associated with those slides. So this person may have had a biopsy for cancer uh, in you know, this time frame, and then the health outcome they had 10 years later was X. What we want to do is analyze all of this historical data so that the next time tomorrow, when somebody comes in and they get a slide analyzed, we can actually say, oh, this is actually that thing. Um, in real time. And so the same basic uh, reasoning of um, using inputs to predict outputs uh, based on historical trend analysis remains true. Um, now, I want to emphasize I'm oversimplifying uh, because that pathology project is trying to do more than one thing. Uh, but in, in general, that's the story. All right, great. Uh, next, we have a question from Dustin. He said he noticed on the slide about the helicopter, it stated that there was only about 74% successful uh, to detect the glass over. Are there later plans for more improvements and was it more prone to false positives or false negatives? Well, uh, I, I realize, you know, it would be very cooler if it said 99% uh, accurate. But if I told you, um, I could tell you, you know, with 74% accuracy, whether, you know, anytime in the next 100 days, you were going to like get a bunch of people killed and lose tens of you know tens of millions of dollars worth of military hardware. Seventy four percent kicks ass. I mean that is we feel great about seventy four percent. And then I also want to emphasize that yes, I mean that that number this um, the you know actually the original version of this slide deck was locked down in July, uh, and so it wouldn't surprise me at all if the number is already better. Um, when we when we fielded the first prototype um, of this system. Uh, you know, the accuracy was 50%. And that's not 50% as in coin flip. Um, that's 50%, you know, versus the previous state of the art, which was we have no clue whatsoever um, if there's ever going to be glass over. So like 100% of the time, we just assume there's not, and then we get screwed. Um, so going from like, hey, uh, we think there's a 50% probability this disaster is coming your way, even that is quite useful. 
Um, and 74% is after, you know, consultation with the user, tweaking it based on what we observe, what the impact is in the field. Um, and that's why they're, you know, excited to actually put it into operational use. All right, great. And next we have from Kanish, he says, in your predictive analytic methods, do you take lead time into consideration? And what is its value? Uh, how do you decide uh, lead time when applying predictive analytics? Yeah, um, so the, the ultimate um, answer is going to be on a project-by-project project basis. Um, there's some projects where lead time is super important, uh, and there's some projects where it's uh, less important. Um, and I realize that's kind of an, uh, an imperfect answer, but that, that is the truth. I see. All right. And uh, just coming back a little bit, I wanted to address some of the challenges that you've encountered, uh, specifically with integrating humans and AI technology. Like, what are some of the biases you've come across that the Jake has had to overcome when selling the capabilities of AI in the Department of Defense? Sure. Um, well, I think the there's... Uh, First, I want to sort of emphasize sympathy for the user um, is, is really important because, you know, from our perspective, the people that we're trying to help, uh, the people that we're trying to serve are usually, you know, super overworked uh, in really dangerous situations quite frequently, right? And so uh, if they just came back from a really scary, you know, deployment or from pulling, you know, in like two all night shifts in a row, and then they're going to get on, you know, a, a conference call with us to give us feedback on how the use of our prototype went. Um, we're really grateful for that, um, and I think that um, that sort of sympathy for the user and an understanding that it, we're really grateful for the inputs that they provide is sort of our starting point um, for all of those kinds of interactions. And uh, so. One thing I also want to bring up is you published a paper back in 2017 uh, on artificial intelligence and national security. And I wanted to ask, how has the AI landscape changed since you published that paper? And how has the Jake um, adapted to that? Sure. Well, um, yeah, th this was a paper that I wrote for uh, the U.S. intelligence community, uh, in particular, IARPA. So if you're familiar with DARPA, which I mentioned previously in this chat, um, DARPA serves the military. IARPA serves the intelligence community, but it's sort of the same uh, thing, but then because they are super smart technologists, they often ask get asked you know to advise on uh, trend analysis and and policy questions. Um, and so that's the that's how I got roped into writing that paper back in 2017. And that paper was a survey of the entire um, intersection of AI and national security and the entire landscape um, of how this technology might transform AI and national security. I would say the the number one thing that has changed. Uh, between 2017 and today is a recognition of the importance of this issue. Um, you know, in 2016, you know, if you wanted to get a meeting um, with a, you know, a three-star or four-star general and say, hey, I'd really like to talk to you about how AI is going to transform the future of national security, um, well, that was damn near impossible um, because they didn't really know what AI was or why it might be important. Um, and even if it was important, it didn't seem like it would be important to them because they have a really important job and a really hard job with a lot of other stuff to work on that day. Um, and that has certainly changed. Um, it is obviously the case that all of the congressional committees that look on at national security, um, that the National Security Council in the White House, uh, that both political parties and the sort of military leadership, in general, folks get it. Um, that AI is is a big deal, but go back to my go back to my computers story, right? Computers ultimately were a massive deal uh, for national security, but in 19 you know 42 there was only one important application of computers, maybe two, uh, and that was like cryptography and decoding you know uh, German um, radio traffic. Uh, flash forward to the 50s, you know, there's like a few other capabilities, the 60s, 70s, you know, there's more and more. And now, you know, today, every single important um, military system has computers on it. And so, you know, one challenge is folks know that AI is important for national security, but is it important enough for my job today? And that's a question folks have to ask themselves. And, and we try and work really hard. And we think that some of the best advice that we give folks is, um, actually, 
you you don't need to be focused on AI right now because it's not a good fit for your use case or there aren't the relevant data sets there. Um, we want folks to work on the projects that are actually going to deliver a really good return on investment, uh, both from a financial perspective and from a U.S. national security perspective. And so working with, you know, end users and people who have, you know, budget um, to understand, you know, what their priorities should be, both from the projects that they do go after and the projects they don't go after, both are pretty important. Great. And it doesn't look like we have any more questions coming through the chat. So I just want to take that st the question one uh, one step further, and we can wrap it up after that. Uh, so I'd just like to ask, what are some of the future directions that Jake is taking to advance AI adoption? Yeah, I would say, um, in general, the Department of Defense has come you know, kind of a long way in three years. Uh, when the Jake first got started, um, it really was only the research community that knew anything about AI. Um, but in the future, uh, we think that there, right now, there's just a much larger AI community. We actually hosted a DOD-wide um, AI conference, uh, and it included thousands of attendees from you know, pockets all across the Department of Defense. Um, so there's a, just a much greater community, uh, community awareness um, of the importance of this issue. And so I think you're going to see AI sort of baked into more and more applications. But before you can before you can develop AI products or AI enabled capabilities, there are some long lead items uh, that you have to work with, especially with machine learning. Um, if you don't have data, uh, you're not going to develop anything interesting with machine learning. Period. I mean, um, data is a prerequisite for doing anything interesting. And so, some of the stuff that we're doing at the Jake that is really useful is just advising folks. Do you have a data strategy? Uh, do you have a requirement for any military platform that you're developing? Um, is it going to be outputting data? Where is that data going to be stored? Is it in the types of formats and the types of consistency that lend itself to future uh, machine learning use? You know, it, it, it was pretty tough for us to um, take the H60 helicopter and integrate all of those data feeds into a way that was actually uh, compatible with sort of machine learning requirements. Because when they were thinking about the H60, nobody was thinking about that kind of integrated data analysis. Um, and so I think as more and more types of military systems are uh, developed, not just with a vision towards, you know, what is the specific capability that I'm going to solve today, but how can I make sure that I uh, store, collect and store data to upgrade myself using AI capabilities in the future, um, that kind of mindset shift is going to lay the groundwork for some really impressive work, you know, next decade, the decade after that. All right, that's that's great, Greg. I'm really excited to see uh, some of the work you continue to do with the Jake. And uh, for me personally, as well as on behalf of Cerner, I'd just like to say thank you for coming and talking to us today about your work at the Jake. Um, it was, again, it was really great to hear uh, everything that you've put into this over the last few years. So thank you. Yeah, thanks to everyone. And I, I hope you enjoyed the talk.